In the 6th century, an historian called Gildas writes about a decisive British victory against the Saxons at a place called Baden. I lie here, head heavy, limbs weary, mind confused. <laughs> I lie here, I scan the room with my blurry eyes. In the 9th century, 300 years later, a monk called Nennius edits together extracts from earlier British histories. An unmade bed, an empty glass, clothes strewn around the floor. I scanned the room with blurry eyes. How did I get here? He records the Battle of Baden as being the culmination of 12 significant victories for British kings that was fought by a warlord named Arthur. It's never mattered to me whether Arthur and the knights existed or didn't exist. What matters to me is the idea. The legend begins. I met a guy in a pub once in Shepton Mallet. Uh, he was called Arthur Sales. He claimed that he was a descendant of King Arthur. A hundred years later, an historical record called the Welsh Annals confirms that Arthur was indeed the victor of the Battle of Baden. Somewhere in the human psyche there is this idea, this ideal, which has been represented in, in this form as maybe a myth or a book or a legend, word of mouth, but there's obviously a need for this myth, otherwise it would never have been generated. I'm naked. And the stained sheets and the damp between my legs, I must have had sex. I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. And also that Arthur dies in a battle at a place called Camlon. He told me uh, he wasn't a king and he wasn't um, called Arthur, he was called Arthur after the light, you know, the Norse comic here with the hammer. At this time, Arthur was a well-known character in the Celtic tradition of oral folklore. If there was an Arthur, he would have been fighting Anglo-Saxons um, during the 5th and 6th century. The room, dark and overbearing, Heavy, dark, masculine furniture, a massive bed draped in heavy linen sheets. Because so many writers have written about the story, it's all sort of fuzzy, you know what I mean? Um, he ran a successful iron forge business, um, he was an enthusiastic warlord, and if he was alive today, he'd be in a Norwegian heavy metal band. But it isn't until many of these tales are brought together by Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 12th century, 600 years after these events are supposed to take place, that the legend is really established. This is Merlin's magic at the party, at the end of all parties. At this point in the legend's history, Arthur is now a king. He is just and powerful, and has an enchanted sword with which he slays giants and conquers Roman armies in Europe. In the darkness by the back door lurked that figure Merlin. I wanted him out of my house, away from my sight, out of my mind. 
noble knights aspire to join his court, and characters such as Merlin and Guinevere emerge. His friend Uther is standing there in his long wax coat and massive leather hat hanging down his back. Lurches towards me, arm extended with a full glass of wine in his hand. Inspired by Geoffrey, French poet Was includes the concept of the round table and also the prediction that King Arthur and his knights will one day return to Britain in its hour of need. Fellow Frenchman, Chrétien de Troyes, then writes five romantic stories about Arthur that involve Lancelot, his affair with Queen Guinevere, and of course, the quest for the Holy Grail. I think it comes from um, several verbal bases, uh, from people from South Wales and people of Cornwall. Uh, which were really one tribe, sharing stories together with some stuff that was brought in from the continent. King Uther is dead. I will be the next Queen of England. <sighs> I, that we were trading with the Byzantine Empire here um, on an unprecedented scale, and those uh, stories of Odysseus and people like that would have been included. And I said, oh, well, we've got a very similar character. So one wonders if... Uh, Arthur isn't a little bit of, you know, Odysseus, a little bit of uh, hook alarm from Ireland as well, mixed in for good measure. In the 15th century, a soldier, Sir Thomas Mallory, breaks the legend down into individual stories. My head is crashing. I've been drugged. For sure that is what this is. I'm in a strange room. The bitter taste in my mouth is not the taste of sullied wine. It is the taste of poison. And William Caxton prints and publishes them with a wider circulation than ever before. I've been drugged and duped and entered into sex with a man I despise. In the Victorian times, Lord Alfred Tennyson writes 12 books of poetry and in this collection, Arthur has become the embodiment of virtue. This, this is Merlin's magic. A drug he gave to Arthur to put in my drink. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit, shit. At my own husband's wake, at the party to end all parties, I was seduced. What does that make me? Today, numerous films have been made about the legend of King Arthur and it inspires people throughout the world.